All right, welcome everybody to week 62. We're going to continue our discussion of digital logic uh, this time. Uh, let's see how you did on the quiz. Uh, give me some idea what I should go over. Uh, four, five, and six. Hmm, not great. Not great at all. No. Um, so, if you've got set A, which is A, B, and C, and B is B, C, and D, the union of A with the complement of B, complement means uh, everything not in B, um, well, that you're unioning A with an infinite set, so you're getting an infinite set. Um, this is a countable infinity. Um, so anytime you can kind of enumerate all the different things, um, it's countable. Um, for example, you go A through Z, then you go A, 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 B, A, C, all the way down through A, Z, and then you can just kind of type them all out that way. So it is not a infinity greater than alphabetical. Um, because you can put that into one-to-one -one correspondence with um, the counting numbers and four four I don't know this is the this is the yeah this is wrong for two reasons um, that's a union B but remember the absolute value signs are the size of the set so um, that's just yeah it's wrong wrong twice over. Uh, this is the size of that set, but you probably didn't see the you see there the C is complement. The complement means everything not in the set. Okay. Match a logic gate with the symbol uh, and or not. Uh, yeah, no, a little dot is not. So, yeah, the um, Yes, the dot means not. Okay. Or if it's just by itself, a triangle with a dot on the end of it. Technically, a triangle is a, a, a diode, and so a diode just um, lets current flow through it forward, and so it kind of doesn't do anything. If you input one, you output one. If you input zero, you output zero. So um, you toss a, a knot onto that, and then you get a knot gate. But really, the, the little dot is is not there. Okay. So, yeah, not bad on that one. All right. Let's continue our discussion then. It's kind of where we stopped. And, uh, and so this slide here shows how NAND can be used to emulate pretty much any gate. It's not... You know, so on and so forth. That's XOR, not XOR. Now, all these things, all these gates, um, are implemented using things called transistors. So we saw last time how just with NAND gates, nothing else, you can uh, hold a bit of memory. You can do and or not. And those things can be used to build things like addition and things like that. I don't think I showed you addition. Um, it's probably worth going over it. So like, um, if you want to add a bit, right? So let's so you got X and Y. And you, you want to output X plus Y. True, true. True, false, false, true, false, false. True plus true is what? 10, right? Not just true. It's 2. 1 plus 1 is 2. 
1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 0 is 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, 0 plus 0 is 0. So, you might notice this thing here has uh, two outputs, really. It's really outputting two digits, right? And this is called the carry bit, named after the uh, famous Stephen King movie, Carrie, about a girl who uh, gets made fun of and then kills everybody at prom. Yeah. And then this is the, I don't know, output bit or something. All right, so... Um, when you do addition, you actually have two bits coming out of it. One is the the bit, you know, if you're if you're adding numbers up, you know, like one two three plus one one one, you have the current output four three two. But then sometimes you get a carry bit, right? If you guys remember that from your elementary school days. So technically, technically every addition you do, you're gonna output the output for the current spot, and you're gonna output a carry bit to see if you carry a one over into the next one. They're all gonna laugh at that a little bit. That's right, that's exactly right. Then it gets bloody and red, like the ink on the slide. So, um, so one plus zero is one, zero plus one is one, one plus one is zero, zero plus zero is zero. So for the output bit, or the current digit bit, whatever you wanna call it, it's this here. Which logic gate is this? One one x y output. Which logic gate is this? The output is true if either input is true, but not both. What is that? What logic gate is that? It's not or. Or would be a one here. What logic gate is it when the output is true, if either of them is true but not both? There's a name for that. Or, nor, mm -hmm. it's a different kind of or. It's not an inclusive or. It's an exclusive or. So this is XOR. You guys remember that? In uh, C++, it's that. The little exponential symbol that uh, confuses the hell out of new students. All right. So XOR means one or the other is true, but not both. And so the output bit is the XOR of X and Y. And then what is the carry bit? The one that really flips out. That one is x, y, the carry bit. What, what truth table is this? And, very good, Tomas. Yeah. So um, addition can be implemented using an XOR gate and a AND gate. Yeah. So if we, uh, want to wire it up, we got X and Y coming into this um, block called one bit adder, named after the snake. We've got an output bit and we've got a carry bit. Okay. And if you double click on this thing, zoom in on it, uh, right? So if, if we pass in one and one, we'll get one and zero, right? Uh, if we double click on this and zoom in, you're going to see it looks like this. So, um, X, Y, there's going to be a bullet. That's the carry bit. And then there is going to be an XOR. Um, do you guys remember what the XOR symbol looks like? It's a Starfleet symbol with an extra um, curved line at the bottom of it. Okay. And that's your circuit.
to and in an XOR. Okay, so that's a one bit adder. Now, if you're going to be doing uh, a bunch of these things, what's going to have to happen though is that you've got uh, a bunch of uh, bits coming in for X, right? You're going to have a bunch of bits coming in for Y. And then when you do like an 8-bit addition, the carry has to come into the, the next adder. So in addition to X and Y, you're going to have the carry, the input carry coming in here and uh, adding in as well. So um, in that case, you can actually hook up two of them, kind of like this. And uh, you can have the input carry, the Y, and the X like that. And then you'll, you'll have the output and the carry here. Okay. Or let's see. I think you have to, yeah, you have to do one more as well. But yeah, that's that's the general idea. And then the carry from that goes into the next one, and then the carry from that goes into the next one. And you just end up copying and pasting it a bunch of times. You want to do 32-bit addition. Well, it ends up looking like this. Zero plus one, zero. One plus one is zero. Carry the one, one plus zero plus one is zero, carry the one, one plus one plus one is one, carry the one, one plus zero plus zero is one, carry nothing, zero plus zero is zero, one plus one is zero, carry the one, one plus one plus one is one, and then the extra one overflows out. And this would be how an 8-bit adder works. Okay. You guys understand? And so it's just a bunch of these, you know, one bit adders kind of just chained together. That's it. Bunch of adds, bunch of XORs, you got arithmetic. What do you guys think? It was in hardware. See how they turn them into blocks. Carry out. I'll see if anybody has the entire. Yeah, okay. So you have uh, X and Y. Here they call it A and B. Okay. You have the carry in. And uh, look, it's an XOR and an AND. Look, and uh, like I said, you have to you have to chain together another one to do uh, the carry as well. So they've got another XOR and another AND, and then to handle the the bits being combined, you've got an OR in there as well. So uh, then you've got the output bit here, and you've got the carry bit here. The carry bit feeds into these, and they do it again, and they do it again, and they do it again, and it's the same repeating block of logic gates over and over again. So for every bit you want to add, it's one, two, three, four, five logic logic gates. Okay. So if you want to add 32 bits together, it would be 160 um, logic gates. And so that's already at the point where we just like, like you can see that most of those illustrations here just don't, like they just don't even want to draw 160 logic gates, you know what I mean? Ooh, this one is showing it actually with uh, the uh, uh, transistors. That's cool. Yeah, that's what we're about to talk about too. Because ultimately, these logic gates are just transistors. Okay. And so you got a full adder here. Carry, it's got a carry in. Takes in X and Y. Outputs the carry out and the bit. And you just hook up a bunch of these full adders together. Each full adder is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 um, transistors. That's interesting. 
I would have thought it would have been 10, oh wait, 11, 12, yeah, okay. Uh, and it is outputting the, the inverse and the regular as well, okay. So transistors, let's talk about those. So the annotations, yeah, transistors. Transistors make up logic gates. Okay. And this is the bottom level of where our exploration of the low levels of your CPU stop. Okay. So how do you make a trans... What is a transistor, first of all? So a transistor is a switch. That's it. So... Uh, it, it has, uh, you can actually buy transistors, um, and, and actually wire them if you want. If you ever built like a transistor radio or something like that as a kid, you buy them and they're pretty cheap. Um, they look like this. Oh. Or this is more common probably. And, uh, pretty cheap and uh, they got three inputs to them, okay? So they have an input voltage, current tries to flow in this way, they got an output, flows out this way, and then they have a third wire there that is the control. If the voltage is high, current flows. If the voltage is low, current doesn't flow. That's it. So it's just, it's like if I was yelling at somebody over by my light switch over there, hey, turn off the lights, and they go click, and they turn off the lights. Or I could say, hey, turn on the lights, they click, they turn on the lights. This uh, this B thing here is just, if if that voltage is high, voltage flows here. If voltage is low, voltage doesn't flow. That's it. And then uh, that's, that's for something called an NPN uh, transistor. There's also PNP transistors that are the opposite. It, this turns on when the voltage is low and it turns off when the voltage is high and they're more or less inverse, you know, things from each other. Does this seem too simple for you or too complicated? I still haven't told you how transistors are made. Like in a CPU, if you've got a billion transistors, how the hell do they fit a billion of those little tin pot looking things inside of a, a CPU? Do you understand this conceptually though? The voltage is high, current flows. The voltage is low, current doesn't flow. And, uh, you know, electronics people are probably mad at me right now because I'm not talking about how they're used as amplifiers and things like that. Like, if you know in here does like um, metal, like you, you'll have like as B increases, as B goes up, then the output goes up also. Uh, so transistors are also used for amplifiers. But at the end of the day, if you're talking about a digital signal, which we are, we're in digital logic day, not analog, uh, it doesn't matter. We're not caring about them as amplifiers. B is either true or false. Okay, here's a truth table for it. Here's a truth table for it. B, and then, um, you know, output. E, in this case. Okay. Is that too complicated or too easy? B is a gatekeeper. Yeah, it's just, is the... Is the light switch up or is it down? The light switch is up, current flows. The light switch is down, current doesn't flow. Okay. So how the hell do we turn that into an AND or an OR or not? Kind of like true or false. Yeah, I mean, everything's true or false in digital logic. So, uh, check it out. Let's look at some, let's look at some stuff. Hmm? Okay. So, uh, 
let's say this is five volts. Again, in a CP, it's not gonna be five volts. Let's say that's our five volts. And then this is our ground, which is zero volts. Oh, I don't need to write it, it's zero volts. Okay, and this is the output voltage. Okay. So, some of the time, the output voltage is gonna be true, which is to say five volts. And sometimes the output voltage is gonna be zero, which is to say false. Okay, and it depends on what this is set to. Okay, so if we set uh, the input to be zero, then when we do that, we have a little switch here, like a physical switch in real life. We could breadboard this up. If we set the input B to be zero, then uh, no current flows from E to C, and you get a zero. If you, you however, turn the switch to here, the input voltage is now five volts, current flows to here. Okay. So um, that's how you could like wire up a transistor. So dang it, uh, steal URLs. So let me show you how to make an AND gate using transistors. Okay. This is the same site. That's literally the same site. Okay. Well, how did you change? Save. Okay. So anyhow, let's go back into that. So let's zoom in. So we've got two inputs, right? Because it's an AND gate, right? What we're what we're implementing, uh, uh, what we're implementing is what we're implementing is an AND gate, right? So we're Im we're implementing one of these things, right? We've got A, we got B, and then the output here should be A anded with B. Okay. So we just came to my front door. It's probably spam. Uh, hang on for one second. Let's continue. So, how the hell is this thing here an AND gate? Do you guys see this? What do you think? Is there a website we can mess around with? Yeah, it's right here. Do you see how this is an AND gate? This is one of the switches right here. This is one of the switches here. If that switch is turned on and that switch is turned on, then current flows through the circuit. If either of these is turned off, then current does not flow through the circuit. Easy? Or complicated? Remember, if a light switch is on, light travel, uh, electricity travels through it. And so both of these light switches need to be on. If A is true and B is true, then current flows to the output. What's 10K mean? That's the resistance. So it has such high resistance, you don't have current flowing through it. It just is supplying a voltage, not, not current. You guys see that? So imagine this just as a light switch. Okay, if A is turned on and B is turned on, then things go through. If A is on and B is off, then it tries flowing through, but then this one's off, so it stops. Okay, that's the output of the logic gate. So this is the input, this is the input, and that's the other input, and then that's the output of the logic gate. So if you have true and true, you get true. True and false, you get false. False and true, false. False and false, false. Where true means, in this case, six volts, I guess. And false means ground, zero. The output is the voltage, yeah. True is, you know, I've been using five volts as my true, but they're using 
They're using six volts here. It doesn't really matter. Uh, zero volts is false. Zero is false. And then, you know, whatever this is, is true. Okay. Okay. Let's look at an OR gate. So for this one, uh, if you follow the wiring, you got your you got your uh, A here, you got your B here. This is six volts. This is zero. Um, current splits off and it tries flowing through this thing here, and it splits off and it tries flowing through this thing here. Now, if both A and B are off, if both of these light switches are set to off, no current can flow through either of them, and so you get a false down here because it's hooked up to ground. But if either A or B is true, then current will flow from six volts into the output. So if A is true and B is true, output's true. If A is true and B is false, current will flow this way and be true. If A is false and B is true, current flows this way and be true. But if they're both false, then it can't go either way and you end up getting zero volts. You guys understand that? It's like a lot of silence on the chat channel. So like, um, let's put it this way. If I put this on a quiz, would you be able to solve it? Ask your question now so that if you're confused, you get it resolved now. Like you guys, you guys understand what a transistor is? It's just a light. It's a light switch. If A is true, then current flows. If it's false, current doesn't flow. Oh. NAND is the same as AND, except um, if both of them are true, then it connects the output with ground. So if both A and B are true, then this is essentially wired right into ground. For any other value, these are not attached to ground and said output is six volts instead. So, um, How do you make a buffer? Yeah. One one transistor. <clears throat> a knot. How do you make one? So a knot gate is one transistor. All the other ones are two transistors. Okay. <clears throat> so for this one, uh, if the light switch is on, then the out here is wired to ground. This output is ground. If the light switch is off, then the output is wired to 6 volts. You might be like, but wait, it's always wired to 6 volts. Yeah, it's got a 4.7 thousand ohm resistor in here. So um, if, it's a, if it is attached to both 6 volts and a ground, it's going to be outputting ground because this is a giant resistor in here. But if this is off, then it's wired to 6 volts and it has a 6 volt output. It's like code of in a physical form. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so the, um, I have to delete this one. Uh, and so this is literally how, you know, you do software and hardware, right? You can attach a bunch of gates together and have them do addition or subtraction or multiplication or whatever. Okay. So, um, and so using two transistors, this one's two transistors, two transistors, one transistor, two, two. And so basically that's why when you hear on a CPU, oh, this has a billion transistors or whatever, um, basically it's the logic gates that, you know, they're talking about, right? So you can kind of add up how many logic gates you have and, um, and 
one of the one of the things you might you might think like a NAND you might think that a NAND gate is just an AND with a knot sitting at the end of it, but you can actually do a NAND in two gates also, right? So it's not exactly always what you think, and there's optimizations and things like that. But in general, this will this will give you an idea. So if there's like ten AND gates and ten NANDs, then that would be a total of forty transistors you would need to implement that. So, um, is the limiting factor in Moore's law? Yeah, I mean that's a big part of it. So let's um, let's talk a little bit about how transistors are made. We'll call this one "Mommy." Where do transistors come from? Okay, so. Um, so the original um, the original transistor was invented by a guy named uh, uh, Sh 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 I can't remember the guy's name. Shockley, not Shackley. Shockley. Yeah. So there was a. Um, it's like Shackleford. No, it's not right. Um, so they're invented uh, by a team of people back in the day, and people very quickly realized how important these things were because um, you can more or less implement any logic circuit you want just using transistors, right? So uh, over the years, though, they, they went from... They looked like this originally. They looked like these, like, War of the Worlds kind of tripod-looking things. Um, and, you know, they had much bigger ones, actually, even, even back then. Uh, they went from these things into, like, nowadays you have a CPU, right? And have you guys ever held a CPU in your hands? Have you done a build on a computer? Do you know how big a CPU is, roughly? You thought his name would be a Transistor. That's funny. So you got four billion on a Zen two. Threadripper has forty billion transistors. The Epic, uh, which is what our, our server has, it's forty billion transistors. Not bad, not bad. Thirty billion in a NVIDIA chip. Yeah. So basically, inside of a CPU, a lot of pins. Is that where the name for getting shock comes from? People have been getting shocked for a long time, but it's a cool name. Like if your name is Shockley, like you just got to become an electrical engineer. It's just required. It's like in Dungeons and Dragons when somebody's like, "My name is Aaron Greenbow. I'm a ranger." It's like you had to become a ranger. You're from the Greenbow family, you know. I'm, I'm Orog Rage Fist. Like you're a barbarian, right? Yeah. How did you know? Because your your last name's Rage Fist. My, my whole family is Rage Fist, yeah. They're all barbarians, yeah. Cool. So, Ventus name is Crentus. Yeah, uh, there's, near us, there's an OBGYN. Uh, uh, actually, uh, no, in San Diego. There's an OBGYN whose who's last name is Stork, which I think is pretty funny. You have Stork delivering babies, you know. And there's another OBGYN whose last name is... Uh, yeah, the, uh, there, there's various puns and things like that. Okay, so uh, you've got a CPU. The CPU has, some, you know, let's just say, let's just say a billion, just to keep things easy. Uh, a billion transistors inside of it. So deep within this thing, you're gonna have all sorts of like little, little transistors, and they're all wired together. And if you tried printing out the entire circuit diagram for this thing, uh, it would drive you insane, right? Like it's just too big and too complicated. Okay, but the question is, how is this thing made? Because this thing, and what the hell is that thing? Well, the uh, the reason why something is called an NPN or a PNP transistor is because you have these substances that are called uh, semiconductors. Well, this whole thing is a semiconductor. Uh, uh, you have silicon. Okay, let's just put it that way. And you can dope it with ions so that it 
permanently is like positive or permanently like negative. And then if you apply If you apply a voltage to the middle part here, then current flows through it. And if you set zero volts here, current does not flow through it. And that's all it is. So it's it's three sandwiched layers of silicon, or uh, three zones of silicon, one that is doped with negative ions, one that's doped with positive ions, and one that's doped with negative ions. And um, I might have that backwards, but either way. Um, then it's the other transistor. And if you apply a voltage here, then current flows, and if you don't, voltage doesn't flow. And if you're like, that doesn't make any sense, that's absolutely correct, because below the electrical engineering level is the physics level, and we're not going to touch into that. But that's essentially what's happening here. Okay? So that's, that's a stopping point for us going downwards in our exploration of what the hell is happening inside of your, your computer. Okay, so how do you make this? Well, what you do is you take a giant block of silicon. In fact, it looks like it, uh, you have a giant block of silicon. These things look like platters. I actually took my students to the Intel Museum in San Jose a couple of years ago, and they, they spin out these giant uh, platters of silicon. And what they do is they are gonna print multiple CPUs on each of these platters, okay? And uh, yeah, and we're gonna do this last year in 2019. And actually in 2018, we had it all approved, but we couldn't come up with the, uh, um, the, fun the, the we, no, we had funding. They couldn't find a bus for us. So we're like, all right, we'll just do it in 2019. So we moved it to 2019. No, sorry, sorry. Fall 2019. And then we moved it to spring of 2020. And we had, we had a reservation, we had the bus, and then the pandemic hit and it had to be canceled. So, um, yeah, it's kind of annoying. Um, so uh, they have these So they start off with these, okay? And uh, these are incredibly pure. If you have any impurities in it, then your CPUs don't work and people get mad because it wastes the money. That might, yeah. That's, we, we saw one of these at the Intel Museum. This might even be at, no, I guess, maybe. Is that at the... No, it's in Beijing. Okay, cool. So, um, basically these are incredibly pure um, blocks of silicon. They're then sliced into these things that look like record players. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys know what vinyl vinyl is, but they're sliced into these platters like this. And uh, oh, that's pretty cool looking. That's neat. Um, yes, yeah, so they slice them horizontally to form, yeah, there you go, to form these like platters. And then the CPUs are going to be printed onto it. Okay. And they print onto it by using what's called um, photolithography. Okay. And so um, we don't use film technology anymore, like, you know, for cameras, right? But we kind of use it still for doing uh, CPU manufacturing. So what we do is we put something called a photoresist on the top of the silicon. And that's like, um, if you guys have ever seen old, old school film, like if you expose it to light, it develops, All right? Have you guys ever seen like a roll of film? I don't know how old you are, but like we used to have these things called cameras and you'd put film into them. And when you take a picture, the shutter would open briefly and then close. And then the light that would come in would develop the, um, or, or it change the chemical pattern on the film and the backing. And, uh, uh, never develop them. Yeah. So, but that's, that's literally what, what happens. So you have this photoresist on it 
And then you just have a laser, essentially. Uh, not essentially, it is a laser. And uh, the laser is uh, going to shine light on the... It's going to shine light on this um, photoresist coated block of silicon. And wherever it develops, then um, what they do is they wash it away. They, they wash away the, the photoresist afterwards. If it's developed, it stays. Uh, if it wasn't developed, it gets washed away. And so now you've, you've put a little layer on here and then you can etch away the areas that, um, uh, with like acid or whatever, you can etch away the areas that were not covered in the photoresist. And then you take the photoresist off and there you go. So you've, you've actually been able to print a pattern onto um, silicon. And uh, you've, you've got two different layers here and you're basically eating away the silicon oxide um, layer. And then you dope it with, um, Yep, and then you dope it, and you create those uh, PNN in regions, and the uh, transistors are planar transistors. They're on the surface of silicon, and um, and then you can do multiple layers of this if you want. Um, it's um, you know you, you do quite a few layers these days, but that's that's the general um, that's the general thing that's going on. And the magic at the bottom of the day is that um, ability for a transistor to to work via NNP regions in the. Let's see if there's any good pictures of these. Yeah. So a friend of mine makes this. So a friend of mine uh, makes the um, lasers that are used to make CPUs. And uh, these are very very expensive machines, by the way. Very expensive machines. And he knows it so well that he could, these, these things are like the size of this room or something. I don't know. Like they're gargantuan, very, very high, high precision machines that are capable of sending a, a laser, you know, down to the, the nanometer precision. And it, and it gets really hard to do that because when you shoot light through a slit, you get diffraction, right? And so they mask out the diffraction. Like there's all these like, really, really complicated things they have to do to make these these lasers be able to draw a very, very precise line on the photoresist. And um, if he had to, he could build that whole machine from scratch. I'm like, how long would it take you? Like, if they just gave you the parts, like, how, how long would it take you to build one of those things? He's like, about a week. And I could tell his heart rate kind of went up thinking about that. It's, it's a hell of a hell of a task. Okay. Um, So, uh, yeah, this is, you know, if this stuff doesn't look like computer science to you, you're, you're right. We've, we've, this is beyond computer science, you know, all this kind of stuff here. Um, this you're, you're getting now down, uh, this is even below the computer engineering level. You're now down in the electrical engineering level and maybe even to the physics level. Okay. So, uh, being able to make smaller and smaller lines allows you to make smaller and smaller transistors, which allows you to pack more and more transistors onto the same area of chip. And that is something um, which for years um, we were getting better at. Um, something called Moore's Law. Um, Moore's Law was about the density of transistors on a, on a chip. And uh, for years uh, it was like the density of chips double every, every 18 months. And um, And sometimes people express Moore's law in terms of clock rate, because um, clock rate was also doubling every 18 months. So here you have um, Intel bragging about their. Uh, <laughs> this is this is before TSMC came in and started um, slaughtering them. It's really quite funny. So millions of logic transistors per square millimeter. 
So this is how many transistors you can pack into a square millimeter. Okay, so in this case, 100 million. And they're, they're bragging that the competitors just can't keep up. And in fact, it's true. During that time period, we went from having about a dozen competitors in this market to about three. Um, so by about a couple years ago, there was TSMC, Intel, and Samsung as about the only companies that were making chips at the high end. And uh, right now it's down to, I don't know, it, Intel might start farming out their work to TSMC also. So, um, yeah. so this is a logarithmic scale, and you can see that the amount of, uh, what's this, transistors? The amount of transistors on a chip do you guys see this? These are this is an exponential axis. This isn't a linear axis. This is an exponential axis. Okay. So uh, the amount of transistors we're able to put onto um, a chip has been going up exponentially over the years. So between 1990 and 2000, you know, and between 2000 and 2010, like this is a hundred times, a thousand times more, you know. And it's made possible a lot of things that wouldn't have been possible before because we have so much computational power now that we're able to do a lot of cool stuff like real-time ray tracing in video games, you know, and things like that. The wafers, yeah, that's the word I was searching for. Thank you, silicon wafer. Um, yeah, that's that's the word, not a platter. So, um, yeah, and so here's what it looks like after you've printed a bunch of chips on it, maybe. Yeah, PLC microcircuit. So. Yeah, so that's kind of what, what it looks like. And then you just cut these things out and slap a package on them. What you think of as a CPU is not actually CPU. Uh, melted polysilic doping, see crystal, spin it out. Yeah. So two, 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 two different size wafers and when you pattern it out, um, a lot of them don't fit entirely on it. Let's see here. Die preparation. So they're taping it. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. And so they slice it up and then they package it. So what you what you think of as a CPU is actually actually packaged. And so these things, like you've ever seen a chip, you know, like if you've ever seen a clip art of a chip, it probably looks like this. And um, this is called a dip chip here, dual inline package chip. And that's actually not the chip. And so if you ever see like a, a CPU, um, if you ever see what a CPU looks like, uh, it, what you're actually thinking of is like this. That's actually the package. That's actually not the chip. <laughs> when you're touching it, you're actually touching the heat spreader. The chip itself is actually about yay big or so on the inside of it, I think. Um, this giant metal thing here is actually a heat spreader. So you can touch that thing. You're not touching the chip. Okay. Um, and so these things look huge. They're actually, um, if you were to open the package on it, uh, I mean, an i9 is actually kind of big. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of your CPUs, if you were to bust the package open, you, yeah, there you go. So you can see that the, the actual chip on the inside is actually much smaller than the, the package that you're used to handling. It's all a lie, man. It's all a lie. So, um, so yeah. And so basically, as people like my buddy have figured out how to make the lasers more and more precise, you can draw smaller and smaller lines and make smaller and smaller transistors. And the more transistors you have, the more addition you can do, the more subtraction you can do, the more multiplication you can do, all sorts of fancy stuff you can do. And that's why CPUs get better. Okay. And if they're closer together, you can probably increase the, the clock rate too, even though we've kind of hit um, kind of uh, a speed of light issue. Like, like literally the speed of light is kind of a problem. Um, do you know how far light travels? Anyone know how fast the speed of light is? 
nobody said anything on on Discord in a while, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch you a, an underhand soft softball. No, just like uh, how fast is the speed of light? Pretty fast, right? Okay, that's a big number. It's a really big number. Speed travels, you know, light travels pretty fast. If you have a one gigahertz CPU, would that be considered fast or slow these days? If you had a one gigahertz CPU. You're bragging to your friends on Discord. Hey man, I just got a one gigahertz CPU. Is that fast or slow? Pretty slow. Okay, so a gigahertz, a billion times, we talked about this last time. What a, what a gigahertz CPU means is that inside of your, your CPU, you've got a little vibrating crystal or something, and the voltage goes high, the voltage goes low, that's one cycle. And it does that a billion times per second. High, low, high, low, high, low. When it goes high, everything in the CPU, all the machinery, you can it's not machinery, but you can think of it as machinery, all that turns on and it, can, and it does some computations. When it goes low, everything settles down. When it goes high, it does a computation, it goes low, everything settles down. And, uh, and it does that a billion times a second. So here's a question. How far does light travel in a billionth of a second? Because one of these clock high, clock low things, that's a billionth of a second, right? So how far does light travel in a billionth of a second? A mile? What do you think? How far do you think light travels in a billionth of a second? In a nanosecond. If you just had to guess, just guess. Yeah, it's pretty much exactly one foot. So uh, Grace Hopper, who's one of my personal heroes, um, she um, used to give out nanoseconds to people. So what she's holding in her hand there is a nanosecond. That's how far light travels in a billionth of a second. Pretty close to exactly a foot, which is pretty cool. That makes the foot a more scientific um, measurement than a meter, in my opinion. I think we ought to just have adopted the nanosecond as our standard unit to measure. It makes a lot more sense to me than a meter. I don't know. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, light only travels a foot in a billionth of a second. So if you've got a 4 gigahertz CPU, how far does light travel? Not a fan of the metric system? No, the metric system's fine. I mean, I think that, you know, using powers of 10 instead of having, like, qubits and heck dakers and bushels and things like that, like, it's a good system. I just think that their choice of like base units was like kind of dumb or earliest, you know, I mean, when they made it, they probably didn't even know what a light nanosecond was, but you know, like they, it, it's like the decay of this number of atoms and, you know, they like Celsius is not a very good measurement unit for daily life, right? Fahrenheit is based on human body temperature, which is far more relevant than boiling water. Unless you're being boiled, you know, Celsius, you only use the low end of the Celsius scale, right? The hottest day is about, the hottest temperature on Earth was about 54 degrees Celsius, you know? So you get kind of half the precision. Because humans round all the time, right? We round to like two digits or one digit. It's in the 50s, it's in the 60s. That's yeah, it's about 75 right now, you know? And with Celsius, you lose precision. So this is a pet peeve of mine. So how far does light travel? Come on, answer. How far does light travel in, four, if you have a four gigahertz CPU, how far does light travel in the amount of time to do one cycle? If you have a one gigahertz CPU, light travels a foot. So on a four gigahertz CPU, light travels what? Four feet? No. <laughs> no, you have less time. The CPU is running four times faster, right? So there's even less chance for the light to, to move, right? Quarter foot or three inches. That's how far light travels 
in one cycle up and down on a four gigahertz CPU. So if you've been wondering why we haven't had like eight gigahertz CPUs, which we should have, right? Because um, if you look at the clock rate of, um, of CPUs over the years, rather than transistor density, which Moore's law clock rate, if you look at the clock rate over the years, this is also an exponential curve. You see that? 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. It's actually going up exponentially, right? Uh, no, this is transistor count. Sorry, clock speed. Here you go. So clock speed was going up exponentially also. And then around, yeah, around 15 years ago, it went... <laughs> so, um, yeah, because... If you had an eight gigahertz CPU, which we should have, like if, if you're just following the trend from the eighties onwards, clock speeds were doubling every 18 months. And so we should have by that logic, uh, we had, we hit three, four gigahertz, like, um, man, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, 10 years ago. It's all blurry now. Um, and so by that logic, we should have, uh, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, like 64 gigahertz CPUs now, like if that trend had followed. Like when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, you had to throw away your computer every 18 months because it was twice as slow as the, the new top end. And then another 18 months went by and you'd really have to throw it away because it's now a quarter as fast. Like you couldn't play anything, right? And so it was just a right, you know, it was just a regular passage. Every other year, you threw away your old computer and bought a new one. Nowadays, it's like, well, your old... CPU is kind of fine. Like I used an Intel 2600K for like eight years. And when I finally upgraded to my Core i9-7900X, um, I benchmarked The Witcher 3 before and after, and there was no difference in performance. Like it was entirely GPU bound as far as performance goes. And so there, there was like no benefit to some, some of my games. Some games are CPU bound, but for most of my games, there was not a single bit of performance difference. From an eight year from a Core i seven to a Core i nine eight years later, there was like no difference for most of the games at this point. Yeah, the speed of light is a hard limit, you know. And so, if you it, it, yeah, if we had a sixty four um, gigahertz um, CPU, then light would be able to travel a sixty fourth of a foot. Um, and so the thing would have to be like that that big, you know. So, uh, so they can't. So, uh, yeah, if you look at this, like, you know, it's basically flammed out here. Uh, power draw performance per clock has gotten better a little bit. So that's, you know, kind of what, and this is 2010 too. Like this is not even, it's not even recent. Moore's law, let's see, 2016. 2011, 2008. Come on, guys, give me something. Clock rate according to Moore's Law, exponential growth, forget Moore's Law. No, all of these are from the before times. Okay. Um, 2011, 2010, Moore's Law ending. Yeah, it's capping out. 2010. Why do you not have something more, more recent? 2000, 2010. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, it's kind of sad that I even have, you know, let's search for something. Uh, da, 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 anytime in the past month. Okay. Transistors per square millimeter. Um, but I'm caring about clock rate. No, whatever. So, um, two thousand. Sad. 
yeah so that's that's basically where um how hardware is okay so the very smallest level you've got a laser and it's just developing film and then you wash it you do like an acid wash or something to top take the top layer off and then you've got these different uh, layers of uh, doped and undoped regions that um, are transistors and then you can layer multiple of those on top of each other and there's different 3d printing techniques and stuff like that that are things um, that are very very advanced stuff that doesn't really matter for our purposes our purposes is just to understand at the very lowest level you can print transistors onto a silicon chip and transistors can make up um, logic gates and logic gates can do anything they can do memory they can do addition subtraction if statements whatever all that stuff they're used to doing in hardware or software you can do in hardware okay so you guys understand are you guys excited you, you guys want to get into electrical engineering now you want to make that your new your new major make these things like my buddy But this is, for us as computer science majors, that's the lowest level. Below that, you're getting into like double E world and the physics world. And all you need to know is just that. You just, you know, once you're done with that, you're done with that. Yep. And you can build a CPU given enough time. In fact, I've built a CPU before. I've built a CPU from scratch um, with nothing but logic gates. I built an 8-bit CPU and it would have a program that was baked into ROM, read-only memory. And when it launched, it would pull the one instruction at a time out of ROM, de decode the instruction, figure out, okay, this is an, ad an addition. Okay, what does it want me to add? It wants me to add that and that. Okay, let me add that and that, and puts the result into that. Okay, subtract that from that and that. And if I had a, f and you could hit run, it was simulated in software. I didn't etch it onto silicon because that's expensive. But, uh, it's it was simulated in hardware and it all the, you could look at all the voltages going up and down and things like that and it was a big big project to do but you could do it it takes a while i'm able to understand this a little bit from experiences with arduinos uh physics b scared you away from electrical stuff electrical stuff's not bad like especially digital logic because in digital logic you got either a high or you got low and that's it so is current flowing this way or is it like is your voltage coming from he here or is it coming from here that's it is it true or false so digital logic you know is b true cool it flows five volts comes to five volts if it's false zero volts that's it so um digital logic is actually pretty easy it's it's when you start trying to like build a cpu that it gets complicated because it's just a lot of work. It's a lot of work because you have to build into hardware addition. You have to build into hardware subtraction. You have to build into hardware the ability to grab things from ROM and look at the first four bits and figure out which command you're supposed to be doing from those first four bits. And all of that stuff is possible. Uh, I'm not going to teach it because this is not a digital logic class, but, uh, that you know with what you understand now if you thought about it a little bit you would very very slowly be able to put together a cpu so over 20 weeks <laughs> you learn more in 45 about this yeah we talk we talk more about voltages and stuff like that in 45 for sure following based on tf b is equal to t question mark f yeah yeah if if b is true then the output is true if b is false the output is false that's it. It's a very simple truth table. So, um, but you can combine two of those to make an AND gate and combine two of them to make an OR gate. So all, all of the wondrous stuff you have, PowerPoint, all this stuff is just running on a substrate of just transistors that somebody made using Kodak technology <laughs> from the 1800s, right? Film, film development this is essentially what it is. Developing film. All right, so let's take a break. It's 11 o'clock. Let's come back at 11.20.
and uh, we will show you something a little more relevant to you, maybe. This is interesting, but I'm going to show you guys how to write better if statements. Okay, so let's pause here. You know, it's already 11, not 11, 10, 11, 20, 11, 20. Okay. Recording again. So <clears throat> now we're going to show you a little bit more computer science relevant stuff, I think. I mean, it's, it's all, it's all relevant. You know, it's like, you need to know, really, you kind of need to know what's happening behind the scenes. And in CSI 45, we're going to talk about what's called computer architecture which is like how CPUs are designed and structured and the different building blocks of the CPU, things like that. And that's all really important to know. Uh, it, it really is. Even if, even if you don't work with it, even if you don't become a computer engineer, still knowing things like uh, how caches work and things like that can result in a 10 times faster program for you. And, uh, and that could be as simple as like having your code go left to right top to bottom instead of top to bottom, left to right, which you would think doesn't make a difference. Like if you had a, a big array, you need to add up all the elements in it. The, whether you add it up this way or this way can make like a 10 times difference in performance. And uh, that surprises people who uh, haven't taken computer architecture. But you know, when you've taken computer architecture, then uh, you know, you're like, yeah, that's, that's how it is. And, uh, you know, at Microsoft, they routinely look for performance regressions. A performance regression means that your code is still correct, but it runs slower now. And so if your code is still correct, but slower, that's oftentimes grounds for your code to be rejected. Because why would they take something that is just as correct, <clears throat> but slower? You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. All right, so let's let's talk about something a little more. Uh, I guess we can kill this one here. Okay. A little more relevant. Have you guys seen truth tables before? I've done truth tables. You've seen these things. We kind of go over them at various points in your computer science career. They're new to you. Okay. Well, it's a way of describing the output of like an if statement, right? Or something. <clears throat> so you've got the inputs here on the left-hand side. You've got the output here on the right-hand side. And so if the input of A is true, the input of B is true, then the output of F is, you can check the truth table. See so if the input is true and the output is true, or sorry, input one is true, input two is true, then the output is true. Okay. So you can consult the truth table to see how these different logic gates behave. If the input is true, the output is false. If the input is false, the output is true. That's a not gate, you know? If either of them are true, or both, the output's true. Um, an AND is an AND gate with a not slapped on top of it, so instead of, uh, I don't know why they do this upside down, but whatever, 0, 0, 0, 1, it's 1, 0, 0, 0. Oh, uh, oh, sorry, 1, 1, 1, 0, sorry. 1, 1, 1, 0 is an AND gate. It's just an AND gate with a um, not slapped on the end of it. A NOR gate is an OR gate with a not slapped on it. So it goes from 0, 1, 1, 1 to 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay. So uh, one of the uses of truth tables is to determine if two, two things are equivalent. So for example, if I, if I give you a circuit, if I give you a circuit or an IF statement, same thing, and I'm going to tie this all into IF statements because same thing, just ones and harder ones in software. So if I asked you, is it true that if uh, not um, A and B, is that the same thing as if I had written the if statement like this? Let's find some open spot. If not A or with not B. Are these two things equivalent? What do you think? Are these two things equivalent? Let's find out. 
you know, and we use truth tables for this. So for this one, uh, let's have A and B. And when you do truth table, you typically do one step at a time. So the innermost step is A ended with B. So let me show you how to do truth tables. True, 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 false, false, true, false. Ah, it's at the very bottom of the screen. Uh, dang it. <laughs> false, false. <laughs> okay, so A ended with B. So what you do is these are your inputs, right? And then if you're going to be computing like a big complicated thing like this, you just do uh, two, two things at a time because and and or just take two inputs and they give one output. So uh, A ended with B. So if A is true and B is true, Tomas, what is A ended with B? True. Yeah. And then for the other ones, it's all false, right? So we'd write down the truth table as 1, 0, 0, 0. Right. And now we do the next thing in this Boolean expression, which is the not. And not only takes one parameter, so that's actually pretty easy to do. Not A ended with B. So what is, uh, so that the input of this one is this row here. And so we just not, or that column there. So we just not that column, right? So true becomes false, false becomes true. We have false, true, true, true. And that is the output, okay? So the output of this guy is false, true, true, true. Actually, I'm gonna have to erase this. So the output of, let's see, let's make it small if not a handed with b is equal to true, false, false, or false, true, true, true. And now we want to see if this is equivalent to if not a or with not b. Okay. So let's let's find out if this is the same. So we're going to do a truth table again, this time a little bit off the bottom of the screen so that we can see it a little better. So we've got our, our four possibilities. So when you have two binary inputs, you've got four possibilities, true and false, for each one. Combinatorics, right? True, 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 false, false, true, false, false. And so we just pick one of the innermost ones, uh, which would be not A or not B. Let's do not A, I guess. And so not takes one variable instead of two, and it's taking this column here as input, and it's nodding it. So 1100 zero, zero becomes 0011. Zero, zero, one, one. And then we'll do the other innermost operation, which is not B. And uh, that one takes B, the column B is an input, and it knots it. So 1010 becomes 0101. Are you guys with me so far? And so when you work on a truth table, you're kind of doing one column at a time. So you got your inputs over on the left, and you just kind of work your way, making new columns to the right. As you do this, um, not A ORed with not B. This is taking two inputs. One is not A, which is this one and one is not B, which is this one, and we're going to OR them together. So false ORed with false is false, false ORed with true is true, true ORed with false is true, true ORed with true is true. And so the output of this one is also 0, 1, 1, 1. So what does this tell us? What does this tell us about these two circuits slash these two if statements? They're the same, very good. Yeah, so this is how you can prove equality of two different um, Boolean expressions, two different if statements, two different logic circuits. Um, it's all the same. It's just ones in hardware, ones in software, ones in the world of math. All the same. Because if you pass in, let's say A is true and B is false to both of them, you get the same result. So for every possible input, they give the same output. So they are logically equivalent. And that's how truth tables work. So, uh, and what I just proved to you there was something called uh, De Morgan's Law. De Morgan's Law states that if not A ended with B is the same thing as if not A or with not B and vice versa. If not a ORD with B, that's the same thing as if 
not A, handed with not B. It's like you can distribute a knot. It's like you can distribute a knot across a logical operation. You knot both sides and you change an AND to an OR. It's kind of like when you have like a, a inequality, you like multiply by negative one, you get negative X is greater than negative Y, right? You guys remember that from algebra? You like if you like distribute a negative one, or like the negative one attaches to each of the parts, and then the inner part changes from less than to greater than, or greater than to less than. It's the same thing with logic here. If you distribute a knot across an and, you knot each side, and the and turns into an or. And I proved this to be true, so you don't need to believe me. It's proven. Does that make you a better programmer? What do you think? Knowing De Morgan's law. Does that make you a better programmer? It's not a rhetorical question I'm asking. Do you think it makes you a better programmer? Yeah. Because if you know that, if somebody gives you an if statement, if not y anded with x ord with not y ord with not x and people will have really large if statements sometimes sometimes you're like um that's really complicated i want to simplify it so maybe you rewrite this part here is not y ord with not x and then you see you've got not y ord with not y ord with not x you're like that's completely redundant delete you know, don't delete both of them. Keep one of them. <laughs> delete, delete the, delete the redundant ones, and you end up with not y or with not x. And so, in my professional career, I've done this many times. I've been handed an if statement that is like unholy in its size and complexities, and I stare at it, and like blood starts trickling out of my eyes, and I'm just like, "Who the hell wrote this thing?" And I'm like, "At least it works, right? Tell me it works." No, nope, it doesn't work. There's a bug somewhere within it. I'm like, there's like 40 different, there's like 40 different ands and ors and nots in this thing, dude. And there's like blood just like coming out of my ears now. And I'm like, what the hell? What the hell? You know? And I start staring at it some more and I'm like, they've repeated the same terms multiple times in here. And they've got knots and, and I'm just going to simplify this down. So I used De Morgan's Law. And made everything, you know, you know, canceled out all the knots. And, you know, if you had a knot, you know, not, not X, that's the same thing as X, right? There's different rules that we're going to learn on about the next slide. Uh, like this. Does, but does this make sense to you? Like, if you have not, not X, that's the same as X? Like, does that make sense? Because... If you nod it twice, you get the original back, right? So, um, there's rules for transforming logic like this. And you can use these rules to make your code cleaner, more readable, faster, and less bu less buggy. You know, what I found was somewhere, somewhere deep within this guts of this giant, it was like X ended with not Y, or with not X ended with not Z, Ord with not Q, ord with Q ended with Z. Like somewhere within the depths of it, like one of these things was supposed to be an and. There was an or. And there's 40 different parts to this if statement. And one of the symbols is wrong. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna learn we're gonna learn about that. We're gonna learn all about that. That is our next big topic. Okay, um, I'm not going to have time to get to the inventory homework today. i just turn it in on Tuesday or something. Um, we're running out of time already. Okay, so truth equivalency. Um, yeah, so here's the first one. If you not not x, you get x. Okay, if you and x with its opposite, you get false. Stop me if any of these things, like, like do you, do you understand why this is the case? If x was true, then not x is false, so you get false. If x was false and you and it with not x, 
get false. So no matter how you and something with its opposite, you can simplify that and just write a zero there. Does that make sense? So if I if I told you, you know, what is x anded with not x or with x? How would you, what what is this if statement boil down to? If x anded, that's a horrible ampersand. If x anded with not x or with x what is this the equivalent to? How could you rewrite this if statement? How could you rewrite this if statement to make it simpler, cleaner, faster? Just leave it there. Would it be one? Nope. I'll write it again in case you can't read my handwriting. So you come across code. You've got some Boolean X, right? It sets some value. Don't know what. And later on we have if X and not X forward with x do something how could you rewrite this if statement okay so one of the rules is if you and something with its opposite you get zero okay if you or something with its opposite you get true right because if if x is true or with false you get true false or with true is true true or with false is true anything anded with true is always the thing Anything anded with false is false. Anything ORed with true is true. Anything ORed with false is the thing. Anything XORed with true is the not of it. And anything XORed with zero is the original thing. These are your basic rules of logic. And you can apply them to a overly complicated if statement to simplify it down. You get the simplest representation. Yeah. So the approach that I would take to this is I would look at this and be like x and with not x. Okay, that's just false. So now we've got if zero or with x, right? But if you or zero with something, are you doing anything? No. If x was true, true or with false is true. If x was false, false or with false is false. It's just x, right? It's this rule right here. Okay. And so there's different rules of logic that control uh, the control, you know, well, it's not controlling, but you can just use them to simplify if statements down. So let's, uh, let's do another one. If I give you if x or with y or with not x or with y, what is this? Could you do this on a multiple choice qu quiz? On Canvas. Well, I mean, first of all, let's look at this Y ord with Y thing. If you, if you write if Y or Y, what's that equivalent to? Y, yeah. Right, because if Y is true, true or with true is true. If Y is false, false or with false is false. So completely redundant, you can just write if Y. So we just kind of throw that away. It makes it make things simpler on you. And then we can rewrite it like this. If X or with not X or with Y, what is X or with not X? What rule is that? Uh, 
But you shouldn't even need to look at the rules, honestly. All this is just common sense. If you or something with its opposite, it's always going to be true. Right? Because you have 1 and 0, or you have 0 and 1. Okay? So this part here, we can just replace with true. Say if true or y. What is true or y? That rule. If y is true, the output's true. If y is false, the output's true. So what does this simplify down to? True. Yeah. It's that whole big complicated thing I wrote there. That's the exact same thing as if I had written if true. This is a uh, this is a big topic. You don't have to you don't have to get it immediately, but um, it's yeah you know, pretty pretty straightforward for most of them. The XOR um, let me explain the XOR I guess. So X Y X XOR Y true 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 false false true false false. So XOR exclusive or is uh, different from inclusive or. Inclusive or we call or. Exclusive or we write as xor. Sometimes as eor as well. You'll see that as well. Um, exclusive or is the or we use in English when we say or with a stress on it. Okay. Uh, ternary operators are just if statements. There's there's no uh, but but instead of being a statement, they're an expression. But the same same logic simplifies down. So, what is the difference between or and xor? Well, if you uh, if your mom tells you, hey, would you like pizza or spaghetti for dinner tonight? A logician student might be yes, I would like both. Right? Because the logician says, well, you said or. And or, by default, is inclusive or. Inclusive or allows both sides to be true. Right? And your mom's like, no. Wrong. I said, do you want pizza or spaghetti? And if you say or, that is exclusive or. You don't get both. You have to pick one or the other, but not both. Okay? Do you want pizza or spaghetti? And unfortunately, in English, we use or for both, and we use stress on the word to determine uh, which unstressed, unstressed. We use stress on the word to determine whether it's inclusive or exclusive. Okay. Uh, so if if I uh, if I said, uh, do you want to take the um, uh, test? today or tomorrow, you know, both is not an accept. it's not an answer, right? Like, no, do you want to take it today or tomorrow? You know, it's exclusive or, you have to pick one, okay? So exclusive or looks like this, false, true, true, false, okay? So one or the other has to be true, but not both. If both are true, XOR gives you false. Now. Why are these things the way they are? Well, take a look at it. When y is true, it flips the bit. 1 becomes 0. 0 becomes 1. Okay. When y is 0, it leaves the bit alone. So when y is 1, it flips the bit. x becomes not x. When y is 0, it leaves the bit alone. True stays true. False stays false. Okay. So, XOR is cool stuff. The really nice thing about XOR is that it's reversible. You cannot reverse an AND, you cannot reverse an OR, you can only reverse NOT an XOR. Okay? Right? If you NOT NOT X, you get X, so it's reversible. And if you say X, XOR with 1, XOR with 1, you get X also. Because XORing with 1 is just NOT. Am I speaking Greek or does this make sense to you? 
Not like I think Greek is the hardest language anyway. Am I speaking Japanese to you? <laughs> it's not Mandarin. It's like my Japanese teacher said, if you want an easy A, go take Mandarin. <laughs> All I hear is cursive. So, um, yeah, so let, let, me, let me show you how XOR um, works in practice for cryptography. So we talked about cryptography easier. Uh, uh, easier. Mandarin's easier. Mandarin's definitely easier than Japanese, 100%. Okay, so let's say we've got a bunch of bits. So we've got 1100, and we've got Y, which is uh, 0110, 1100, I don't know, something like that. And let's XOR them together. So when you do a bitwise XOR, you go through every pair of bits and you do an XOR on them. Okay, so what is false XOR with false? You guys remember? Battle soup. It's false. Because one or the other has to be true, but not both. So false, XOR with false is false. True XOR to false. What do you think? True. I think you should have the one student who's actually participating. Uh, false XOR with true. True. True XOR with true. False. This is not or, it's XOR. You cannot have both be true. If you're gonna if I'm asking if you can take the quiz. Today or tomorrow, you can't say true to both of them. You have to pick one. Huh. False XOR with false, it's false. False XOR with true, true. True XOR with true, false. True XOR with false, true. So if you look down here, all the zeros leave the other bit the same. Okay. All the ones flip the bit. So this true became a false, this true became a false, this false became a true. Zeros leave it alone. So if you want to do it real fast, you can just sit there and just leave, just copy down the bits that are where y is zero and flip the bits where y is one. Very quick. And they're symmetrical, so it doesn't matter which one's x, which one's y. They're they're symmetrical. Okay, now uh, let's do this again. X or this result with y again. So y was zero one one zero one one zero zero. From the top, what is zero XOR with zero? False. Here's the truth table. Zero XOR with zero, zero. What is true XOR with zero? True. True XOR with true. False, very good. False XOR with true. True. False. False, true, true. That's X. Look. See that? If you XOR something with Y twice, that's like nodding it. You know, it's like uh, all the bits that were nodded get nodded again. All the bits that were left alone get left alone again. So if you do a 32-bit XOR, on between two 32-bit numbers, some of the bits are gonna flip, some of the bits are gonna be left alone, and if you do the exact same XOR on it again, those bits that were flipped get flipped back, the bits that were left alone still get left alone, and you recover your original message. What do you mean message? Because this is used in cryptography. This is actually unbreakable uh, one-time pad cryptography. We talked about this last time when we were talking about RSA encryption. Uh, this is called OTP, or one-time pad encryption. What you do is you s send out on your battleships uh, these giant pads of ones and zeros, and you keep a copy of it at home, right? And then when they send a message, they just cross off bits, and they XOR the message with the, with the, uh, the bits on the one-time pad. You have yours. When you get a message, you cross off the bits too, and do this and they they send out this this is the um, this is the message that gets sent out over the internet or over the the broadcast waves whatever the Bismarck needs help we've been hit on the rudder you know something like that 
And so people can intercept this message, you know, because you're just sending it out over the radio. But nobody knows, nobody can decipher it. It is literally unbreakable encryption unless you done goofed with your one-time pads. If you ever reuse the bits, they're more or less pointless. And if the uh, random numbers, like I talked about, aren't random, they're kind of pointless. And when you put a bunch of people in a room and told them to just whack keys on the keyboard for eight hours, guess what? It's not very random. So they'll start off very diligent and by the end of uh, minute 10, probably, they're just putting their face on the keyboard and just rolling it left and right. You know what I mean? So you can use XOR to do cryptography. The, um, and the reason why it works is because you do these operations twice. XOR is reversible. So when you encrypt it, half the bits or so are going to be flipped. Half the bits are left alone. So you don't know which ones are flipped, which ones are left alone. You have no way of knowing. And then when you uh, apply the operation, the same operation, a second time, all the bits that were flipped get flipped back. All the bits that were left alone get left alone. And you got your original message again. What do you guys think? Kind of cool? What do you think? Slowly coming together. All right. All right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. So I'll put up a XOR question just for you. Okay, here's De Morgan's Law. Uh, a knot could be distributed across an AND to give you not X ORed with not Y. Uh, the knots distribute and then the AND turns into an OR. Same thing the other way. Knots distribute over an OR to form knots with an AND in between. So that's another good way of simplifying Boolean expressions. Um, Uh, there are no good De Morgan memes on on Google. That's that's the only real downside to this thing. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll stop there. I think I think I've hurt your brain enough for one day. Let's do let's do one more simplification. Okay. If x ended with not mm, x or y. Simplify. And if you haven't finished inventory, uh, do it by Tuesday. Your brain should be hurting. It's good. It's a good sign. It's discrete math. Discrete math is supposed to pulverize your brain a little bit. So, it is not if why. guessing. Keep going. Very good. It is in fact if false. Why? Let's apply De Morgan's law. If x anded with not x anded with not y, x anded with not x is false. False anded with anything is false. So the answer is if false. It's an if statement that will never run. It's if false with more steps. Okay. So. It's like a comment. It's like you've commented out some code. I've seen people do that before. Like they'll write if false, you know, and then they'll just stick in here a bunch of code they just don't want to use. But they don't want to comment it for some reason. So just stick it in there. I don't, I don't do that. At least comment it out. I don't know. Like, I mean, I think technically C++ will parse it. So like if you've got like some sort of, like if you want compilation to fail or something, like um, I think 
I think things inside of here still get parsed. And so like if you're calling functions that don't exist or something, it'll, it'll fail. So there's probably some use for it that is too deep and profound for me to understand, but yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, if you ever, if you ever help CSI 40 students, they're um, like, I was, I was helping a guy the other day, day who said, uh, if X is greater than zero, do something else. If X is greater than zero, do something else. <laughs> and I'm like, no, <laughs> don't do that. Else if X is less than zero, else if X equals zero. And then he had like an else after that. And I'm like, you've got X is greater than zero, X is less than zero, X is equal to zero, and an else. Like, what value of X do you think that's going to be? You know what I mean? Like, you got kind of all your bases covered. Greater than, equal to, less than. What's this? <laughs> what's the fourth option there? I'm curious. You know? And so, uh, you know, it's, it's hard. And, you know, I'm not mocking him. It's just, it's just kind of amusing to me. Um, because... It's like, all right, what, 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 uh, what circumstance do you think that this, this branch will be taken in? You know, if x is equal to negative zero, yeah, x minus equals minus one. Right? I don't know. Like, uh, you know, CSI forty students a lot of times their if statements are just sort of all over the place, um, extraneous ifs and things like that, and that's why I teach this um, because uh, what I found. And I'm going to end with this little personal narrative. Is when I took CSI 26, there was no programming in it whatsoever. And after the inventory assignment, some of that might sound pretty good to you. Uh, but all it was was this kind of stuff. And so they would hand us these giant Boolean expressions of like, uh, you know, x ORD with not x ORD with true ORD with y, you know, you know, and ended with you know q and. Uh, and then you, and it was pen and paper. You just sit there and you know, like, okay, x ORD with not x, that's true. Uh, ORD with true, that's still true. ORD with y, well, that's still true. Ended with q, well, that's just q. You know, and you'd sit there and just solve these things by hand. And I would spend probably 10 hours a week in the coffee shop, pen and paper, doing computer science. And I, I, I don't really like that for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, if you spend a semester not doing programming, your programming skills are going to go down. You know what I mean? So like you just took 40 and 41. It's really important to like build on that in 26. And that's why I give you assignments like inventory where like knowing data structures is really helpful, right? Where like, you know, you could use vectors if you want, um, but sets are probably easier to mess with. You know, they, they eliminate duplicates for you. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, special case any of that stuff, you know, faster, you know, all that stuff. So the, uh, you know, CSI 26, the way that I teach it is half math and half, um, half programming. And so you got to know the math side of things, but like inventory is actually you implementing set theory, right? You're doing intersection and union, which I call unionize because union's a reserved keyword in, uh, C++. Um, and so you, what I found is that when you write code based on mathematical principles, it actually helps you understand the math a lot better. So hopefully you guys found that when you implemented intersection, you implemented union, like it helps you understand set intersection and set union better. Okay. X credit for finishing the inventory in time. Sure. Let's do that. Why not? So, um, uh, why not? So anyhow, the point is, is that you need to, you need to use the stuff that you learn to learn it really. And, um, all this high fluid and mass stuff will just kind of go in one ear and out the other if you don't actually use it for anything. But what I found, because I was working as a professional programmer at the time when I was taking discrete math, I was doing virtual reality, virtual reality game development, arcade games. And, uh, what I found was after doing hour after hour of this stuff and De Morgan's Law and, and I actually printed this out and, and I 
had it taped up to the wall of my, my dorm room as a freshman. I had De Morgan, I had a picture of De Morgan, De Morgan's Law beneath it, and I just wrote Never Forget or something like that. Yeah. You know, basically, um, yeah. Don't forget this, because it was that's how important I found it was. Because I went back kind of through some of my code and I realized how bad some of my if statements were in it. And then as as I started like writing new code. I found like my if statements were getting a lot better, like a lot better. Like I was, you know, that's one of the big benefits of this class is that you start writing better code, which doesn't seem like, you know, this, this all seems like high fluid and math stuff, but these are if statements, like, you know, an if statement takes a Boolean expression. So if you can write a better Boolean expression with less terms, you're writing a better if statement. Okay. So, um, the, uh, the upshot was that after I took discrete math, I stopped having bugs for the most part in my if statements. Before, I would always have these issues where like an if statement would be taken when I wouldn't think it'd be taken or not taken. And I would sometimes not know like if I should do like if, if not X or not Y or not Z, if I should do it that way or if I should write if not X ended with Y ended with Z and and after got to a certain level of complexity sorry I need to close parentheses there after my if statements got to a certain level of complexity my brain would shut down I don't know if you guys have ever felt that way like you're just like in the middle of a giant if statement and like your brain just like stops working right like where wait where was I uh huh <laughs> yeah um and, and that's because if statements are actually exponentially co complex, right? So for every term you have in an if statement, it adds twice the possibilities, right? If you have three things like this, X, Y, and Z, the truth table has eight rows in it. True, 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 false, true, false, true, true, false, 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 true, true, false, true, false, 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 true, false, 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 right? Yet another term, it's now 16. Yet another term, there's now 32 possibilities. And having your human brain, like, think about all 32 possibilities of inputs gets very complicated. Making sure all 32 rows are correct? Probably not. You know what I mean? So, um, it was like, I was, you know, like even something simple like... Um, is something within a rectangle, right? It's got to be, you know, the X has got to be greater than or equal to the X minimum. And the Y has to be greater than or equal to the Y minimum. And the X has to be less than or equal to the X minimum, uh, maximum. And the Y has to be less than or equal to the Y max, right? And so you slap that into an if statement, you know, have fun, right? It's not, it's not even that bad. But like a lot of times when I see students try writing that, they write it with ors. So they say if the value is outside x minimum, or it's outside x maximum, or it's you know, and then they get confused and start using ands instead of ors. And I'm like, yeah, that that if statement's always going to be true. You know, <laughs> if x is greater than x minimum or less than x maximum, right? They'll write this. very common for a new student. If x is greater than x min or x is less than x max. What's the problem with that? It's a rectangle. x min is like 2, x max is like 10, something like that. What's the problem with that? trying to see if something's inside of a triangle or a rectangle. What's wrong? It would not be valid. It's valid. It's valid code. Needs to be end. Yeah, it's true. But what happens when they try running this code?
What's the problem with this? It's very common. I see this all the time. They don't get an error. They do not get an error. Compiles fine, runs fine, except it doesn't run fine. All right, so like, uh, what they want to say is if it's within the rectangle, then, you know, do something, right? And they, they test the code and they put an X that's between X min and X max and it says, yay, you're within the rectangle, cool. Now think about what happens if they type in negative 100. Is negative 100 greater than two? No. Is negative 100 less than 10? Yes. So hey, negative 100 is inside the rectangle too. Let's try positive 100. Is positive 100 greater than two? Yes. Is it less than 10? No. Or yes. Congratulations, 100 is inside of the rectangle. Literally every X value possible is inside of the rectangle. Everything is inside the rectangle. This is the same thing as if I had written if true. Okay, but when they test the code, a lot of times they only test with values inside of the rectangle. Look, it works. It's successfully, you know, determining I'm inside of the rectangle. And then um, they don't test it with numbers outside and then later on it explodes on them because values will be outside of it, so. Um, yeah, every number is either greater than two or less than 10, you know what I mean? So um, one of the real big benefits of this class is that you stop making these dumb mistakes. <laughs> I mean, by and large, I, I, I'm, I'm actually dead serious. Like, you know, if you ask an experienced firm or like, well, how do I, you know, not make mistakes like this? Um, a lot of them will tell you, like, you have to just kind of work with, you know, the, the rules of Boolean algebra and things like that, or, or get experience one or the other. But, you know, the, the big benefit for me from discrete math was being able to write better if statements, like just 100% that was, and it's not like they even told us about this. They didn't give this lecture that I'm giving you right now. They didn't say, Hey, this is going to make you better at computer science. They didn't say, Hey, simplify this if statement. Hell no. It was all, and it was all math. It wasn't even like these symbols, which I'm using from computer science. They were using the, uh, you know, the little carrots and divots and things like that uh, from math. And it's like, just simplify these things and prove that this is equal to this using a truth table. And it was all math. And it was up to you to deter, to discover that, oh, look, I'm better at computer science now. Look at that. That's cool. You know, they, they, didn't, they did not make that explicit at all, in part because the uh, instructor was a math professor, math slash computer science, but mostly she did the work in, in, in math. So yeah, I always try to make my stuff very relevant to programmers and I want you to become better programmers. And that's why I picked the topics that I picked for this class. There's a, the screen math is a giant, um, uh, no, my discrete math textbooks currently being used as a doorstop. Sorry. Um, it's a giant, <laughs> really, it's a giant textbook. And so I get to pick the topics that I talk about. Why did I talk about modular arithmetic? Because it comes up all the time in computer science and in cryptography, and cryptography is fun. Why do I pick this topic? Because it, may, it helps you really become a better programmer. You know what I mean, why hash tables? Because they're the best data structure. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm, I'm picking these math topics and have you do homework assignments like learning SQL, which is like one of the most employable skills you can, you can have. It's not SQL exactly, but it gives you the idea of what it's like to do database programming. And you made a database and you've implemented set theory using programs and algorithms. Yeah. So, um, yeah, everything is deliberately calculated to make you better programmers, make you able to not make beginner mistakes like this and to give you useful stuff. So even though it's a math class, discrete math, um, it's still, you know, I'm, I'm a very practical guy myself. I'm not super huge, uh, it, not super interested in theory. I want to know what it takes to write a good program, you know, and be able to knock out a program quickly, clearly, you know, without extraneous ands and ors and nots and all that kind of stuff. So I want it fast, I want it clean, I want it readable, I want it bug-free, correct? Yeah. Okay, so that's my soliloquy on the purpose of this class. So no homework right now, I'm going to give you a Zybooks, uh, no, no, no programming homework right now. Finish inventory if you haven't finished it already, I'll go grade it right now, I'll give you extra credit for those of you that finished. If your code is printing out of order, you need to message me so I can give you the points. And then I'm just going to throw up a Zybooks on this. 
and give you lots and lots of this homework. Okay? Prepare to meet your doom. Because they use the math symbols, not computer science symbols. All right. Any questions? Yeah, C uh, SQL is a standard requirement. Uh, not not necessarily. Like, there's a lot of jobs that don't require SQL. But it's it's just a really, really good thing to know. Um, and, like, in just my own personal practice, like, jobs that are solved by databases are very, very common. You know what solved that problem? A database. <laughs> you know? Like, that comes up a lot, you know? Oh, you need that? A database would solve that. And let me build the interface to it and stuff. So, okay. Um, there's no questions. Have a great weekend. And be on the lookout for... Uh, always check the modules section on um, Canvas. So, uh, that's where all the assignments and stuff go. Okay, don't, don't expect to get a notification. You know, just check the modules occasionally. Do schools have classes for SQL? Uh, that's actually a class that I want to get um, going here. I want to teach a database class and um, Unix Unix Lab. Those are the two. Those are the two topics that I want really to propose. And then Juan, I think, is interested in um, maybe doing that as well, and also web programming and stuff like that. And we're also thinking about proposing data science. So that, I've been working with Berkeley for the last couple of years on. Uh, basically uh, plagiarizing their curriculum with their permission, their blessing. They contacted me to plagiarize their stuff. So it's not really plagiarizing, but it is. Um, just copying the, the Berkeley program for data science and bringing it here to Clovis. So um, the pandemic kind of threw a wrench into that. But um, yeah. Cool. All right. That's it, guys. See you next time.